Well, I've known John for a long, long time. <clears throat> and uh, I was a pastor in Minnesota. <clears throat> I graduated from Dallas Seminary in 1968, which uh, I guess does date me, but <clears throat> Charlie graduated the same year, so I have company here on that. And then I went up to pastor a church in Minnesota, in uh, Minnetonka, which is a suburb of the Twin Cities. And I hadn't been there more than two or three years, <clears throat> and this young man showed up <clears throat> from the University of Minnesota, and it was John. And we got to know each other then and fellowship together, and uh, he went out to Oregon after a while and attended Ralph Brown Seminary, came back to Minnesota, and I encouraged him to go on to Dallas. It was obvious the Lord had given him some very special linguistic gifts. And he went on to Dallas. He received his THM there. Also, in the year 2000, received his Ph.D. in New Testament literature and Greek exegesis. Now he teaches Greek for us. He's the chairman of the Greek department at uh, Schaefer Seminary. And if you've read some of his articles in our journal, you know this is a man that does high-quality exegetical work. Uh, as we put it sometime, John moves in rarefied air <laughs> with uh, the work that he does. Now, what you're going to hear this morning is the result of some incredible work that he has done recently in the uh, text of Revelation chapter 5. And he has done much work in many of the Greek uh, manuscripts that exist. We hope that John's going to be able to go this coming summer over to Germany, where a lot of the manuscripts are to be found, where he can do uh, further research in this area. But John also has a, a unique way of communicating so we all can grasp what's going on. And I think you're going to be find yourself challenged, uh, and you will find yourself stretched, and that's good for all of us. John, rather than take more of your time, come on up and take charge here. Thank you, George. My parents raised two only children. <laughs> I have only one sibling. He is a year older than George. Uh, he has retired. And then there was me. I came along 16 years later. So my parents had two only children. I was the next to the first speaker of the conference, and I'm the last speaker of the conference. I'm used to being first and last. <laughs> That's a different slant on <laughs> what it is to, that uh, there are many who are first who shall be last, and many who are last shall be first. Well, there are few who are first and last. And I'm finished even before I start. <laughs> uh, for those of you that didn't catch that, Niamela is a Finnish name, and that's so. That's why I have an umlaut. It isn't that I forgot and started uh, dotting my A's. I am absent-minded, but not quite that absent-minded. As we look at this particular passage, it has been a sleeper. And the reason that it's been a sleeper is that there are a lot of people who have covered up the evidence that is there. And the cover-up has gone from the text critics, the translators of English Bibles, and virtually anyone who writes on when the timing of the rapture is, you find half-truths and outright lies in the commentaries as they're dealing with the textual evidence in the passage that we are going to be considering. Some of you may be saying, well, I don't really like the majority text. That's fine. Whether you like or don't like the majority text, it doesn't matter what textual theory you prefer. Your English Bible has messed up either verse 9 or verse 10 under any theory. We have nothing but English Bibles that have mishandled this passage in one place or in the other. What we're going to do is consider the evidence, but I'm going to seek to not spend a lot of time in the really technical part of it. 
The issue that's before us in the book of Revelation is, since it does not explicitly say the rapture occurs at point X, any view of when the rapture happens within the flow of Revelation has to reason through it. Now, so each view seeks to defend the place where it would place the rapture within the flow of the book. Now, I think that there are many arguments that can be made for a pre-trib rapture apart from the passage that we are going to be considering. But this passage, if we understand it, is going to be a very strong presentation of the evidence. Now, if you look on page one, you're going to see that there's a chart and in this chart, it says three in brackets, three, three. That's the text represented by the Nestle all on text. Now, where this is coming from is third person would be a they or a them. So there are going to be three spots within the text where it would be a they or a them. Now, notice that the first one of them is in brackets. And the reason for that, let's uh, read the text, and I will read it here from the page in the chart. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the book and open its seals, because you were slain and have redeemed. Now, if you were reading a New American Standard, New International Version, most any translation, there will be no stated direct object there. So that would be the first column. And so we have a, an M dash saying that nothing's there. So you were slain and have redeemed to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign upon the earth. Okay, the Texas Receptus is the middle column that's represented in the King James and New King James translation. It also makes errors, but its errors are in verse 10. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the book and open its seals because you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. The correct text that is in the majority text and should be in all other Greek texts, the reason that I say that is the evidence leads to the conclusion under any textual theory doesn't matter whether you're looking at Nestle Aland, you're looking at a, an Alexandrian preference. Under that model, they should have put in, the, uh, in verse 9, they should have had us. The majority text reads correctly. But a correct interpretation of the Alexandrian evidence, even if a person threw away all majority manuscripts, threw them all away, forgot all about them, the strongest evidence, even from an Alexandrian standpoint, is going to be, it should read, us, them, and they. So in other words, majority text happens to have it right. But this is not an issue of, do you like the majority text? It's an issue of, do you have a defensible reading in verse 9 and a defensible reading in verse 10? That's the issue. Okay, let's now back up and look at how the text is set up. In Revelation 5, the apostle John becomes distraught. Then one of the elders assures him that Christ is worthy to take the scroll and break its seals. That stops John from weeping. In verses 9 and 10, living creatures and elders sing. In verse 11, a great multitude joins them. And so we have our text. 
And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back. That's a rare event. Scrolls are normally only written on one side. And there's reason we won't go into it. And it was sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming. The reason this is in bold, this is a speaker here within this passage. So a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much. Now John isn't a speaker here, but he wept because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, so here we have a speaker again, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, and here we have speakers again, or actually singers, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now I'll read the majority text reading. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open its seals, because you were slain and have redeemed us to our God, or to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made them kings and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, and the elders. The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And now we have new speakers. Every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then our new speakers, the four living creatures said, Amen. And new speakers, the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Within this, I have a simplified notation for distinguishing the three models. We have the 333 model, which is third person all the way through, an implicit third person the first time. Then the 111, which is going to be us, us, and we. And then the correct reading, us, them, and they. When I read the text, you might have thought, you know, that's kind of a hard reading with a switch between us to them and they. Hmm. For those who have had textual criticism, do you remember the preference for the harder reading? Hmm. This is the harder reading. Okay. On page two, what we have is the Greek text in the same format, except that we have the Greek text presented. Okay, then as we see, I'll, yeah, notice this slide here is again showing the readings as we had it there on page one, or if you translate back into Greek, it would be the way it would be in Greek. Okay, in the middle of page two, we have an overview of textual issues. Now, I prefer the majority text reading for variants one through four. The following chart shows that I am not alone in this. And most of the texts that you're looking at are not particularly favorable to the majority text, as far as the, they're not favorable to the so-called Byzantine manuscripts. But we're going to see that a number of them are also favorable, especially on variant one. That's the one that counts. Now, the Texas Receptus is not uh, a particularly important edition. 
Uh, we have it from a historical standpoint, and it is what is the foundation of the King James and New King James. But the reason I say it's not particularly important is that it was not a critical text. It was not derived in a scientific method. Then we have Tischendorf's eighth edition, signified by a T, W-H for Westcott and Hort. Uh, we have von Soden, Hoskier. Now, Hoskier has the most complete apparatus for the whole book of Revelation. I own both volumes. Uh, unfortunately, I was expecting to have them with me, but they managed to, right now they're in Arizona. So I don't have them to be able to reflect upon, but they're, I own, by the way, I own all of these texts. Merck, Bover, and then the United Bible Society's text and the Nestle Allen text and then the hodges Farstad text. Now if you note the chart, which I've tried to summarize, that's on the top of page 3, the hodges Farstad reading is accepted by all of the editions on the left-hand side of your chart. And the hodges Farstad reading is rejected in all of the editions that are on the right-hand side of the chart. So we have von Soden. If we look at variant 1, which is the most important variant for the purpose of this paper, variant 1 is whether it has the us, which all the left-hand texts would have. Uh, by the way, the 1, 2, and 3 is coming from that previous chart, 1, 2, 3, and 4, that showed the English text. Let's see. Let me back up. Notice there are four lines on this on the right-hand columns. So the top one is number one, second one is number two, third one, three, and fourth one is number four. Okay, so that's how it is going. Now there are brackets around the M, and the M is written lowercase. What that means is that Merck punted. Now how do you punt in a Greek text? You put brackets around a word. That says, maybe it's here, maybe it's not here. So he took a definite maybe. I mean, you know, he's really dogmatic. Thus, maybe, says the Lord. And that, so brackets are a definite no-no in uh, editions of text. They should never appear, but we have a lot of Greek text editors that love to punt. The most famous punter in the area of uh, New Testament studies is Kurt Aland. I mean, he punts hundreds and hundreds of times in his text. Major problem with his text, but don't get me off onto that digression. Bover also accepts that it should be the hemos, or the word us, should be here, as does Hoskier. Now, as we look at von Soden, Vogels, Merck, and Bover, none of them could be accused of liking the majority text. Not one of them. Now, Hoskier can be. Hoskier does like the majority text. But von Soden, Vogels, Merck, and Bover do not. Now, if we're looking at editors who are evaluating the Alexandrian evidence, and they're saying, we think it's here. We think this Hamas is here. I think I'm making my case. This is not a majority text issue. Any textual theory will lead to this. OK, let's uh, look, though, at uh, what the Nestle Alon text says. Uh, the paragraph that starts with furthermore. We have a committee that was responsible for the United Bible Society's text and for the Nestle Halon text. They equivocated upon the reading for Revelation 6, I mean 5 9. In other words, the committee was less than certain about whether the text should read a 1 3 3 or an implicit 3 3 3. Should it have a hey moss in there or nothing? Now, Bruce Metzger indicates that the committee had a confidence level of C. Now that's a definite punt. Now let's see how they define C. 
Uh, Metzger explains, by means of the letters A, B, C, and D, enclosed within braces, at the beginning of each set of textual variants, the committee has sought to indicate the relative degree of certainty arrived at on the basis of internal considerations as well as of external evidence for the reading adopted in the text. The letter A it signifies that the text is virtually certain, while B indicates there is some degree of doubt. The letter C means there is considerable degree of doubt whether the text or whether the apparatus, that is the side margin, contains the superior reading, while D indicates that there is a very high degree of doubt concerning the reading selected for the text. And interestingly enough, after some of the committee members died, and they replaced him with a few other people, Metzger came out with a second edition of his textual commentary. And all of a sudden, despite no change in manuscripts being discovered, I mean, all the same manuscripts that were known when he produced his first edition are still there, but somehow great inflation gave it an A. Now, no one would accuse uh, Nestle Aland of being biased in favor of the majority text. I mean, no one would ever accuse them of that. But within the Alexandrian evidence, they're saying, oh, it's a C until you have some people start dying and you start changing the people on the committee, and then all of a sudden it gets up to be an A they should have left it with their C. They should have said this is a very uncertain reading because the evidence had not changed. The only thing that changed is how many of them were dead. <laughs> okay, page four. What evidence would uh, support the uh, change for it? It's basically death and retirement of some committee members, the addition of new ones. In summary, whether the reader of this ta paper generally prefers the UBS Nestle on text or generally favors the majority text, Revelation 5.9 is a passage where UBS Nestle on has gone out on a limb and they know it. They said it was a rating C. They had good reason to say that. And as we looked at the number of Greek editors, especially ones that like the Alexandrian text, uh, it should be evident that from an external standpoint, there is indeed a difficulty. Okay, let's... This is my summation of what's on that apparatus page, the big page, the uh, legal size page. What we have here are five readings that show up within the text. Some say to theo, that's to God. Now, actually, I said some, but there's only one Greek manuscript that reads that way. Only one out of a lot of manuscripts. Now, it just so happens it is the favorite manuscript of the Alexandrian priorities. It is their favorite manuscript, but it's only one out of all of these manuscripts. Now, let's see, let me explain my chart a little bit. Under Alexandrian, you see one number and then you see a number in parentheses. The number in parentheses is the number of manuscripts that are regarded as top-ranked Alexandrian manuscripts by Alexandrian priorities. So if you have the sheet, this uh, legal sheet, you'll notice that some manuscripts in the first column of your sheet are underlined. The ones that are underlined are regarded as the most important Alexandrian manuscripts. So the number of them that show up for each reading that are regarded as the strongest Alexandrians have a parenthesis around them. So to theo, reading number one would be just to God. Reading number two, to theo hemon, to our God. The hemos would just be the reading us, saying nothing about God. Fourth reading is to theo hemos. By the way, that's the majority text reading. 
And you notice three of the strongest Alexandrian manuscripts read with Totheo Hamos. So of the five most important Alexandrian manuscripts, three of them read that way. Plus, it's the only reading that has a number of what would be regarded as secondary Alexandrian manuscripts. And by the way, when you look at the rest of the manuscripts, 114 is the uh, most sizable section out of the other manuscripts. Now what you have in reading number 5 is reading number 5 means the same thing as reading number 4. You would translate both of them uh, as us to God or to God us, and so it's going to be rendered the same translation either way. So as you look at external evidence, if a person is approaching this from an Alexandrian standpoint, you can see that they had some reason for some question marks. Is this a certain reading? Now this is just looking external evidence, what manuscripts read this particular way. But there's more to it. Now it looks like a couple things got left out of the paper as I revised it from a very technical paper to a somewhat less technical paper. So the thing that I'm going to be talking about right now did not appear in this. But take a look at the very last page of your handout, page 11, the appendix, that has Alexandrinus. Now this is the only Greek manuscript that reads the way that your New American Standard or NIV have rendered this in verse 9, leaving out the word us. What we have is a transcript of one page out of this particular manuscript. The first column is the line number. There are 50 lines on this page. The second column, or on the far right, you have the verse number telling you where you're going to find your verse reference. Then we have the text, but you'll notice that there are words that are in, or letters that are in brackets. The letter that are, letters that are in brackets, the manuscript was damaged, and so we don't know exactly what was said there. We have two columns on this page. Now if we drop down to the line 50, line 50 has a section in here where it says to theo. Now uh, if we go back, reading number one, you see where it says to theo, and you can see how the first column, if you're looking on page 11, ends in those letters, to theo. And now the question becomes, did they include or did they forget, did the scribe forget to include the word us? which should have appeared right after that. Now, what we have is a prepositional phrase. So, uh, not actually not a prepositional phrase, but we have article with a noun, to God. And interestingly enough, in looking at manuscript Alexandrinus, it looks like his ink is darker at the top of the next column than it was here at the bottom. And I think he was thinking, okay, I just put to God, dip my pen, start writing, and forgot to put in a word. You can see how easy it would be for him to do that. He's the only manuscript in Greek that doesn't have it here, and his pen seems to have been dipped in ink as he moved between one column and the next. Wow. Wow. You know, this is regarded as the most significant Alexandrian manuscript on the book of Revelation. But what happens when someone's changing from the bottom of one column to the top of the next column and taking the time to dip their pen? It's really easy to say, oh, I finished that line and start where it makes sense on the next line. So if this is the only manuscript that reads this way, the evidence is starting to look a little less than strong. But, you know, the case goes downhill from there. I mean, that's not the only problem that this reading has. 
But uh, what we'll do is we'll let um, the text critics, by the way, all of these text critics are all post-tribulational. Hmm. You know, you, you kind of wonder, is there a theological axe to grind here? Okay, well, anyway. I think what we end up having is evidence week, pound pulpit, harder. <laughs> so what happens is there becomes a strong guilt by association type of approach. And so what I say near the bottom of page four, the Texas Receptus has almost no manuscript support. Ah, yes. Interestingly enough, let's just uh, consider this. If we look at the uh, evidence on uh, for and against what the... Uh, what in the world did I do? I think I went to sleep while I was typing this. Okay, that happens once in a while. You know, when you get to be my age, it does happen, especially when you're a professor. I think absent-mindedness is part of the qualifications of being a professor. Okay, what this was supposed to say was there's virtually no evidence for the TR for readings number two and number four. So everything that you see off to the right of TR there on the right-hand side, scratch it out. Uh, scribal errors are not the domain exclusively of scribes. <laughs> okay, it's only the TR, and besides that, the reason that only the TR does that, uh, including that, is because what ended up happening was there were only a couple of manuscripts just a couple of them that ended up supporting this. But interestingly enough, the Texas Receptus used Manuscript 1, which was one of those that had the us instead of the they and the them in verse 10. Okay, let me kind of put this together. What we have, let's see, if we back up here, sorry for moving around here, but I'm having to recover from <laughs> just having made an interesting typo. It's really easy to do, as you know. What we have, if you look at the first column where it's them, them, and they, the Nestle Holland reading, that reads very smoothly, having third person all the way through. If you look at the middle column, us, us, and we, that also reads smoothly. The difficult reading is that on the far right, us, them, and they. So what I believe has happened is Alexandrinus, manuscript A, played with verse 9. All of our English translations, except the King James and New King James, are based on what Nestle Allen did. And so what we have is playing with verse 9. But if you read your King James or New King James, they're following the Texas Receptus that played with verse 10 to make it read smoothly. In other words, it reads more smoothly if it's nothing or them, them and they, or us, us and we, rather than switching us, them and they. So this particular statement in here is dealing with the problem in verse 10, and there's a guilt by association saying, well, look at what the TR did, and the majority text followed, I mean, some of these other manuscripts followed what was going on there in verse 10, so it must be contaminated. It's kind of like Tim was talking about, if you learn some truth and you say, oh, does it have some contamination in it? Well, basically, what they're wanting to say is there was some error, and this error came from substandard readings, and it was read into verse 10. And so, therefore, there must be a taint on those manuscripts when they have a particular reading in verse 9. So, okay, let's read the statement again. Texas Receptus has almost no manuscript support 
for having a pair of first person readings in verse 10. While the third person readings in verse 10 are found in virtually all manuscripts, including the significant Alexandrian manuscripts. Certainly, one would not want to follow the Textus Receptus here. The Textus Receptus in verse 9 opposes Alexandrinus by adding the first person pronoun there. Textus Receptus attempt, attempted to produce a smooth reading throughout the passage with, the first, with three first person readings. Furthermore, the reading of verse 9 in Alexandrinus lacks an explicit direct object which could tempt a scribe to add one, as in the reading of the Textus Receptus for verse 9. These facts make the Textus Receptus reading in verse 9 suspect. Well, this statement that I've constructed doesn't have a single outright lie, but it... Uh, is a carefully constructed way of uh, pulling the wool over everyone's eyes. And it resembles the types of statements that we are going to run into. So if we could say that it speaks truths because no outright lies occur. But it does not qualify for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The reason it cannot qualify for being the whole truth is that it says nothing about Alexandrinus being the only Greek manuscript that totally omits the pronoun in verse 9. In other words, the attempt to create guilt by association with the non-critical Texas Receptus in verse 9 is, virtually, is that virtually all manuscripts, including virtually all of the important Alexandrian manuscripts, include the hemos or us in verse 9. The reason it cannot qualify for nothing but the truth is that only an infinitesimally small fraction of manuscripts embody the 111 harmonization that is present in the Texas Receptus. In other words, the sin of harmonization that is present in the TR is irrelevant to the discussion of the more than 200 manuscripts that have the 133 readings. Most of the significant Alexandrian manuscripts read 133, only one Greek manuscript out of all the manuscripts on Revelation supports the reading preferred by UBS and Nesselond. Thus, although the statement does not lie directly, it neither gives the whole truth nor does it give nothing but the truth. An astute reader may say, the statement was not attributed to anyone, so where is the evidence that scholars attempt to use guilt by association? Well, that's an excellent point, and following are some such statements. Bruce Metzger tries to argue that uh, the original text was the 333, but a, a scribe wanted to insert an explicit direct object into verse 9, thus producing a 133 text, which was a hard reading. This hard reading led another scribe to create a 111 text by adjusting readings in verse 10. So here's what he says. He gives it a grade of C considerable doubt exists as to whether it's right. So he says, although the evidence for totheo, to God, is slight, that is A, and the Ethiopic, this reading best accounts for the origin of the others. Wishing to provide uh, he redeemed, or, uh, or you redeemed, rather, with a more exactly determined object than is found in the words from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Kappa, uh, tau, lambda is a way of saying etc. Some scribes introduce hamos either before to thao or after to thao, while others just replace it with us. And so then he says, those who made the emendations however, overlooked the unsuitability of Hamos with Autus in the following verse, where indeed the Texas Receptus reads Hamos, but with quite inadequate authority. What he's saying is, uh, some scribes said, oh, this needs a direct object. I really need to put a direct object in here. Oh, this is so horrible that there's no direct object. I'm going to put one in there. But he doesn't notice that he's just made absolute nonsense of the next verse. So that's what uh, Metzger is saying happened. 
Now, I have a question for Dr. Metzger. Pray tell, why didn't we find a single scribe who was tempted to say, oh, we need a direct object, let's put a them in there. Not one manuscript reads that way. Now, if there was such a driving compulsion to put in a direct object, why not? Why didn't someone put in a them? But we don't find it. Now, Grant Osborne <coughs> uses the same guilt by association argument. He blames later scribes, a code word for Byzantine scribes, and although he admits there is not a lot of manuscript evidence for purchased for God, that is, only A in the Ethiopic, but he does not tell the readers the stark truth that Alexandrinus and the Ethiopic version are the sum total for the evidence favoring his favored reading. The best that he can do is to surmise that the presence of us would result in the cross redeeming angels as well as humans. Okay, in other words, the passage says, you have redeemed us to God by your blood from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Okay, so you can see where he says, oh, if, angel, if uh, since we have four living creatures singing this plus 24 elders, then it would be saying that Christ has redeemed by his work on the cross also uh, angels. And so he says, well, that, that can't be right. So, what he says there is for verse 9, the text critical problem here is essential for the identification of the elders in chapters 4 to 5. If the text should read, uh, redeem, you redeemed us to God with these manuscripts, rather than, uh, then the 24 elders are indeed human rather than angels. There are several problems with this, however and most prefer to omit us. Although there is not a lot of manuscript evidence for purchase for God, Metzger is probably correct in asserting that the shorter reading best explains the longer. Later scribes provided an object to tell the reader who was purchased for God. Moreover, if us is part of the text, then the four living creatures, as well as the elders, would have been redeemed, and the living creatures are certainly celestial beings. So he says, we have a conundrum that this would create a theological problem of Christ redeeming angels. And we would have to say, uh, certainly that would have been a problem if that were what the text did, but that's not what the text does. <clears throat> so again, it's a uh, guilt by association approach. Time that people use guilt by association is when they lack stronger arguments. So we ought to say case unproven, and we could let it go at that, but it's time now for a counterattack. Uh, this is not a time I'm going to walk away, <laughs> making allusion back to Tim's message. Uh, this is a time to strike back. Uh, what we would note is that... Uh, the editors of a number of Greek texts have recognized the problem that exists, the lack of external evidence, and the problems that are present internally. So there have been strong arguments that have been made against accepting what Alexandrinus has to say. Now, let's take a look, though, at Osborne's second argument, where he is indicating that he thinks that it is going to result in angels being redeemed by Christ's work on the cross. Okay, wrong direction, I guess. Okay, we have such things as antiphonal songs. Now, I'm going to pretend that uh, you're all singers and that we have the music, but instead of singing, I'm going to want people to just read it. So read in unison. Now, over here, you'll be the group that's going to read the portion on the left, 
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Then everyone over on this side of the room will read in unison, for his mercy endures forever. And you can see how on page 8 that Psalm 136 is arranged like this, and you can imagine if it were set to music. So, okay, over here, go ahead and read in unison. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. O give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Okay, and you can imagine in the temple that they would be singing this whole psalm, and so you have an antiphonal arrangement that's going back and forth, and they, of course, would select voices and make it so that, you know, everything's really going to work nicely. And I believe that that's what's going on in this passage that we have here. Let me show you the evidence for that. Let's back up to page one of the notes, and I think you'll notice something very interesting. On page one of the notes, we showed the various speakers that happen, that are making statements. In verse two, a strong angel proclaimed, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And in verse 4, since no one was found who was worthy, John wept much. Verse 5, one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Now in verse 8, we have the preparation for this antiphonal song. But what we have is both parts of the choir named. Four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden uh, bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And so now we have to ask the question, when it says, they sang, does they mean everyone? See, I can say, you recited Psalm 136, verses 1 and 2. Well, was there anyone here who said all the words of verse 1 and verse 2? Well, I did. Okay. But notice, I can say you sang it, or you said it, and that doesn't mean you said every single word of it. When you have songs that have parts or antiphonal arrangements or there's a soloist or various things like that, we would still say the choir sang. And so now the question becomes, how many of these and who is singing each part? Now, I think that there's some evidence that uh, points in this direction. Look down at verse 14. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. What's happened here in verse 14 is we've had their parts separated out, what they did. But look at what happens in verse 11. After the singing that occurs for verses 9 and 10, we have them joined by the voice of many angels around the throne. It still is including the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them, that is the total number when they were joined by all of these angels, was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And then in verse 13, they were joined by every creature which is in heaven and on earth. What we have is a growing antiphonal arrangement. And verse 14 says the living creatures did one thing and the 24 elders did another. We should not read verses 9 and 10 as saying that the 24 elders plus the four living creatures said every word of verses 9 and 10. Now, who is it that would be able to say, you have redeemed us to God by your blood from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation? 
Well, it certainly is not the four living creatures. But the 24 elders can say that. And wouldn't it make sense for the four living creatures to say, you have made them, that is the other side of the choir, kings and priests to our God, and they shall reign upon the earth. See, in other words, the problems that have been raised by text critics to try to say, well, this is an impossible reading. And you know, Metzger said it was a, a nonsense reading. And we have statements that you know, this is going to result in Christ redeeming angels at the cross by his blood. And we say, these are imaginary problems. And we start looking at the particular manuscript, manuscript A, that is the only one that reads that way. And even within Alexandrian evidence, that's not sufficient evidence, especially when at the bottom of one line, he just left out a word, dipped his pen, and started writing up at the top. Oh, something else to notice, just for fun. Page 11, where you have the transcript of verse or of uh, Alexandrinus. <coughs> Notice line 28. Do you see the brackets around 4? It's because if you compare your text, you'll notice verses 4 and 5 start similarly. Start with the same words. And he forgot verse 4 and just hopped into verse 5. Easy scribal error. But the fact of the matter is, Alexandrinus has a fair amount of sloppiness. I think he was an absent-minded professor. He's one of those kinds that uh, might put manuscripts reading on both sides. You know, that's kind of like <laughs> putting brackets around things and saying, I punt. But in any event, we don't have the problem that is being pictured here as being such a great difficulty. Now, on page 9, I cite Beale, who wrote a recent commentary on Revelation. He doesn't end up coming down favoring the majority text reading, but he's far more balanced in his treatment. I'll go ahead and read this. He says, external evidence clearly favors the inclusion of us. And let's see, either before or after the, uh, on the words tothao or to God, or instead of tothao, as a more specific direct object than every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Although only A, that is Alexandrinus, and the Ethiopic completely exclude Hamas or us, many interpreters still argue that these two manuscripts Actually, Ethiopic is not a manuscript, but it's a version. That they preserve the original. He redeemed to God. They, that is these editors, do so first because the shorter reading is more difficult. That's odd. Haven't we seen people say that them, them, and they, or us, us, and we is simpler than us, them, and they. See, they're talking simpler reading just looking at verse 9 when they ought to be looking at verses 9 and 10 together. So when he talks about harder reading, he's looking too microscopically, but that's something that text critics tend to do. So they do so first because the shorter reading is more difficult. I disagree with that not having as precise an object. Well, it's true it doesn't have as precise an object, but them would have been the logical one for someone to add if someone were in the business of adding one. It is more likely that a scribe would attempt to clarify the direct object than to do the opposite. Except that for Alexandrinus to omit it, very probably accidentally or possibly on purpose, removes attention with verse 10. This stylistic abruptness 
is another expression of Semitic influence that is characteristic of Revelation. <coughs> and then he says, secondly, Hamas, or us, is not consistent with Autus in what follows in verse 10. Now he says, it is usually thought that the us both here in verse 10 is not original, since them in verse 10 is less disputed both on external and internal grounds. The us of verse 9 is likely secondary. On the other hand, it may not be so improbable that us in verse 9 and them in verse 10 could be original, since this would be a difficult reading. But not impossibly difficult because of the liturgical atmosphere. Antiphonal singing could justify the change in person between verse 9 and verse 10. Also the parallelism of he made them to God with he redeemed to God might point to the presence of a specific object in the latter phrase. In addition, there is the possibility that Codex, the scribe of Codex A accidentally dropped the us when he went from the bottom of one column of the page to begin writing at the top of the next column. And he gives the wording there. The better part of wisdom is to acknowledge the equal possibility of both readings. In this light, us in verse 9 should not serve as a strong argument for identifying the 24 elders as saints or representatives of the saints, nor should the omission of us be an absolute argument against such an identification. So what he's saying here is, okay, you pre-trivers, you've got a wonderful passage, but don't act like you have any strength here. He's saying, uh, you know, there's a little bit of room for doubt, so don't treat this as being a very strong passage. That's what he's saying in that last paragraph. So he has somewhat of a more balanced approach to the evidence, but his conclusion is, uh, don't use this argument for what it proves. Okay. There's something extremely helpful if we move forward here, and that's the implications. And here we're at the bottom of page 9 of the paper. Exegetical implications of us in Revelation 5.9. First, at least some of the 24 elders are Gentiles because they sing, you have redeemed us to God from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. That's a standard way of referring to Gentiles. Now, it doesn't say that all of them are Gentiles, but it says that their number includes Gentiles. These are redeemed Gentiles, at least in part. Furthermore, the 24 elders were redeemed by Christ's blood. You have redeemed us by your blood to God but they are also in heaven because we are looking at Revelation chapters 4 through 6 which has the heavenly scene. And it's, remember how John was weeping when he found out that no one was worthy to open the uh, scroll? Chapter 6 is where the scroll is opened and those sealed judgments start to happen. But they're up in heaven here. And this is the song is sung before the opening of any of the seal judgments. Furthermore, the 24 elders have already been rewarded. Because in verse 10, you have made them kings and priests to our God. The verb make, when it has two objects, you have made them and you have made kings and priests, you have made them to become kings and priests to our God. Right here they're called elders, but they are people with the language here of having made them kings and priests. That's something that comes about by a judgment. And what kind of a judgment is it where someone could have a well-done, good and faithful servant and be made into a ruler. Because we know that the highest of all rewards 
is joint rulership with Christ, and who is it uh, that would be the highest up on the rank? Kings. Those are rulers. And furthermore, it pronounces they will rule. It doesn't say they are ruling, but they will rule. And Christ has not yet opened up the first seal. Now, I would set the timing of first seal as right in the vicinity of the start of the seven-year tribulation. So this does a couple of interesting things. They're in heaven. They have their reward. The judgment seat of Christ has occurred, apparently, during the interim between the rapture and the start of the seven years, which, until I started really wrestling with this passage, I always thought that the Bema seat occurred during the, during the seven years, whereas this passage is causing me to say, hmm, that interim period of time between the rapture and the signing of the covenant seems to be the point where the Bema seat occurs. Is it not interesting that just like we saw text critics lying or telling half-truths about the textual evidence, isn't it interesting that when you read books on the timing of the rapture, that people who do not take a pre-trib view also tell lies and half-truths and twist the evidence and use guilt by association and do all the dirty tricks they can possibly think of doing to say uh, that word us is not there. It even gets blamed as a Byzantine reading. I mean, people use every trick in the book to try to say, leave that word us out. Because as soon as you have the us there, then you have church-age believers, since it's including Gentiles, being in a rulership position. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to square that other than them being church-age people. This passage is a very powerful passage in terms of working with when does the rapture occur within the book of Revelation. Now, George mentioned about the possibility of me going to Germany. There's a very simple reason for doing that. I have that wonderful $175 uh, Greek text of the book of Revelation by Hoskier, the best collation that has been done, the most complete collation that's ever been done on any book in the New Testament is Hoskier on Revelation. That was done in 1929. There are some manuscripts that have surfaced since he did his work. But uh, let's see, I better digress slightly. For those of you who have worked in textual criticism, if you look at that legal sheet, you might notice that there are two manuscript numbers. Hoskier had his own numbers. So anytime you work with Hoskier, you have to convert his numbers into the numbers that everyone else is used to using. But the fact that there has been so much lying and half-truths and innuendos and guilt by association and everything that's gone on on this... I am looking at manuscripts directly and making a complete collation in order that I wouldn't end up saying, well, manuscript A is the only one that reads this way, and then for someone to say, well, you know, Hoskier actually made a mistake. There were two. I want to be on very solid ground when I write a monograph on this particular problem. So that's going to require traveling to Claremont, Princeton, and uh, over to Germany and elsewhere to make sure that I have looked at every single manuscript in order to be sure that I know exactly what the text reads. So doing a collation essentially involves making a transcript of all of those ma manuscripts, except it can be done with a little bit of shorthand. But uh, that's, I think that this passage is strong enough that it's worthy of that kind of work in order to make the case hold together at the level that it really deserves. 
for most purposes, people can say, okay, Hoskier says it. Here's how he lists the evidence. He's probably right. But with as much emotion as attached to when the tribulation happens in relation to the rapture, this is one of those places where I need to go in loaded for bear, and I know that my name will get smeared all over the place. So I mean, going in for something like this is one of those places where you start out with a reputation and you might really end up with a reputation. <laughs> but the Lord's good, and uh, that's, so why don't we pray and then I'll throw it open for questions. Father, we thank you for this passage and for the way that it clarifies some crucial issues. And we thank you for all the evidence that you have left behind to countermand all of the attempts to remove the word us from your text. And we pray that... Uh, we would reflect upon this passage and it would be part of our understanding in relation to the timing of the rapture. And we thank you for the encouragement that it gives us to know that you indeed will distinguish the church so completely from a return to the dispensation of Israel that you rapture the church before the seven years begins. We thank you for the strong evidence here and for the comfort that that indeed gives. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Questions? <coughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you, John. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, does this really give us some foundation so we can say between the rapture and the signing of the peace treaty in the temple that the Bema seat has already taken place? I think that it gives... I, I don't know what else to conclude from it. We yes. The rapture from the book of Revelation. Is this this is what you're going to come up with when you write this book? That's my intent. Okay. Yes. Uh, John, the Net Bible supplies persons there as a, an attempt to do this, to supply the direct object, but noting that it's not uncommon to leave out the direct object. Right. Uh, but this leaves it questionable is who those persons are. Yes. If it's not the... If you don't have the elders saying this, then it could be angels. That, and so there are dispensationalists among them, let's uh, see, Talbot Seminary under uh, the uh, leadership for many years of Robert Thomas he has always argued that it is angels there, and so there are a number of theses and other works that have come out of uh, Talbot uh, saying that uh, the us is not there and that these are angels and so on and so forth. So there are pre-trib people who would argue for it being angels. If nothing is stated, then the extracted direct object becomes those from amongst every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And so you could have angels saying, well, you redeemed people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. So in other words, if angels were to be saying this, if the 24 elders were to be identified as angels, that's allowable under it being... Uh, no explicit direct object. Now, <clears throat> what we have here is if a person leaves out the us, you can still have a pre-trib position. It does not negate it. But an explicit us is just a wonderful thing because of uh, the uh, difficulties for the non-pre-trib position become rather uh, sizable to overcome. Yes? John, this is, this is a vivid illustration of uh, Nestle and Milan's prejudice toward uh, Alexandrian manuscripts. Uh, there, are, there are others. I, I listed about four in a little pamphlet I wrote 
do you know of any study that's done to get further evidence of this, where they'll adapt uh, Codex Olive, for example, when there are thousands of readings Okay, the question there becomes uh, Nessel Alon's preference for certain key Alexandrian manuscripts where they omit all sorts of other evidence. I was digging around for a French quote that I have from de Lobel uh, where he adduces seven times where Nessel Alon went with singular readings of Alexandrinus in the book of Revelation. Now the interesting thing is, I mean this is really funny, and I didn't call attention to it here in the presentation, but uh, there's a, Nestle Aland and Metzger are known as reasoned eclectics. Now there's another group of people called radical eclectics, and there's a big argument between the radicals and the reasoned as to how radical you should be. Now, what eclecticism means you don't necessarily go with external evidence, that is manuscripts, uh, you may favor internal. The radical eclectics say, we will go 100% with internal evidence. Well, not quite 100%. They have a rule. There have to be at least two Greek manuscripts that read a certain way. And so, it's interesting to find all the places where the reasoned eclectics say, oh, how radical, they only require two manuscripts to read this. And de Lobel uh, came up with seven times in the book of Revelation where Nessel Alon defends on one manuscript, and it's always Alexandrinus. And so here they are normally arguing, oh, how radical, this is terrible, look at those liberals. And yet, uh, here they say, well, we've got to do it because uh, we have a bunch of weak internal arguments, basically because we don't want them to be humans. Okay, let me look at another slide that I haven't shown, and I didn't put it as part of the presentation. Antecedent options. Okay, what we have here is 24 elders in heaven. So the horizontal line, what's above it, we have the 24 elders, that would represent them being in heaven, whereas what's below the horizontal line is on earth. Now people sometimes question, uh, what is the antecedent? Should the antecedent of these 24 elders be seen as rewarded Old Testament elders, or rewarded local church elders New Testament era or rewarded believers in general. What I would say is that uh, how many other passages can we think of that have elders in heaven? Zero. And how many passages tell us the identity prior to the millennium of anyone who's going to be an elder in the millennium. Zero, except for this one. So therefore, I do not think that the search for antecedents ends up being a particularly profitable thing. What I would say is, the passage tells us that they're called elders while they're there, but then they are made kings and priests. So I would call it like a temporary terminology that's used for them prior to the point where they start to exercise rule. And so I'm not looking for trying to make them match up with church age elders of churches and so forth, because it seems to me it's more talking about how elders ruled in civil government, and that was a regular feature, the elders of a town and so on and so forth. And so what we have here is, I think, selecting out of highly rewardable church age believers. So don't draw the implication, if you are not an elder of a church, that, there's, uh, that you have no possibility on this one. Because I think it's coming out of that group, and I don't look for antecedents. Because 
I don't see any ground for making an identification of saying, what did these people do before they got to heaven? I don't see any ground for uh, speculating on that issue. Other questions? Okay, well, I, I trust that you'll find this passage to be helpful. I do understand that a little bit of it was technical, but... Uh, <laughs> it's nowhere near as technical as the collation work. That's technical. What most of us uh, consider to be technical, John. <coughs> There we go. What most of us consider to be technical, for John, it's just simple. What he considers technical, forget it. <laughs> but we need people like John who, who will do that kind of hard work, exegetical work, so that we have a good foundation to build our own ministries upon. Well, from Schaefer Seminary, I want to thank every one of you for coming. I think this has been the best conference that we've ever had. <laughs> Connie and her team of people, again, we thank you so much for all you've done to help us. And then we have the technicians back behind the glass who have kept things going. And, of course, all our speakers. We will have, unless the rapture happens between now and next year, uh, <clears throat> it looks like we will be back here in Houston. I know when uh, Robbie first said that, you should have seen the look on Connie's face. <laughs> But I'm sure they'll have their team together, and uh, the way things are going, from what I've been hearing, we're going to have a lot bigger crowd next year. We'll probably have to meet somewhere else, because, you know, the evening services, we've been packed like sardines in here. But that just makes it that much more fun, doesn't it? Uh, I tell you what, I was up in Dallas two weeks ago for the GES conference. And at the end of each of the uh, workshops and the plenary sessions, they had all the people grade us. Uh, I would like for you to do this. Email me sometime in the next week, 10 days or so. Tell me what you liked about the conference. Tell me what you did not like about the conference. And we'll try to continue to improve and to upgrade and to make it better for everybody. So if you'll do that, uh, I'd appreciate that, and then we'll work that into the planning for next year. And be honest. Whatever you tell me will be kept private. And if you have anything to say about me, uh, be gentle and be kind. <laughs> we do believe in free grace, emphasis on grace. Let's keep it that way. <clears throat> but your comments will be greatly appreciated, so please send those in. With that, let's all stand. We'll have a final word of prayer, and we'll conclude for the, this year. Father, once again, we do thank you for these men that you have given spiritual gifts. We thank you for their faithfulness and their willingness to give themselves to the study of your word, that they may then turn around and teach us and help us grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray as a result of this week and the edification that we have received, that you'll give us the wisdom, the skill to take the things that we have learned and to judiciously put them into practice day by day, so that in the end our lives will be a credit to that wonderful grace that you have showered upon us. And for this we pray now in Christ's name. Amen. We'll see you all next year.